Welcome, everybody. Uh, so we're talking about the science of political economy, uh, following Henry George's book of the same name. Let me start by saying, on my walk over here from Penn Station, which is a little more than a mile, I saw two people begging on the street and two people who were collecting cans in huge bags, uh, which I assume they were doing in order to survive. When Henry George, uh, for whom this school is obviously named, came here in, into New York from the then much less developed San Francisco in 1869, he saw pretty much the same thing. Uh, and he was really stunned, you know, struck by the fact that here in one of the greatest cities in the world where you had tremendous opulence, you also could see uh, abject poverty. And this planted more firmly in his mind a question that he had been mulling over a little before then, which is, uh, why does poverty seem to accompany the progress of civilization? Uh, accompany it and actually deepen. Um, this led him to his central insight when he returned to San Francisco shortly after his trip to New York. Uh, and I'll, I'll just uh, read you, as I have done once before in uh, Henry George School, uh, an account of what I call his central insight about what I, I will call the poverty problem. The time is the late summer of 1870, not long after the end of the Civil War. The country is still in the throes of what would come to be known as the Panic and Depression of 1869. The Transcontinental Railroad has just been finished, and uh, with it, the coasts have been brought together. And with that, that was kind of like the closing of the American frontier. And with that closing and the joining of the coast by the railroad, land values in the San Francisco area have skyrocketed. George has gone out riding on his horse and remembers the revelatory moment this way. Absorbed in my own thoughts, I had driven the horse into the hills until he panted. Stopping for breath, I asked a passing teamster for want of something better to say what land was worth there. He pointed to some cows grazing off so far that they looked like mice and said, I don't know exactly, but there is a man over there who will sell some land for $1,000 an acre, which was a huge sum in those days. Like a flash, it came upon me that there was the reason of advancing poverty with advancing wealth. With the growth of population, land grows in value, and the men who work it must pay more for the privilege. I turned back amidst quiet thought to the perception that then came to me and has been with me ever since. So this course is about the science of political economy. Uh, in it, I hope to take George up on his standing invitation to examine his thinking, to decide for ourselves whether he perceived uh, truth about the, the poverty problem. Uh, more specifically, we'll be considering the nature of science, that's where we'll start, and the nature of the science of political economy. And uh, finally, you know, through the course of this course, whether George succeeded in describing and developing a science. Uh, or, in other words, whether we think he discovered truth in that realm. In other words, was George right? So I want to start by considering two images. One, on, on the one hand, we'll, we'll talk about the poverty problem, or, or keep that in your mind, this phenomenon that George and anyone in, in his day noticed, and also what the economic landscape would have looked like then, and pretty much what it looks like now for anybody trying to solve that problem. Great buildings, edifices, wonderful machines, structures that signaled a highly developed civilization. In George's day, that those might be steam engines, great ships, libraries, beautiful public buildings. Uh, in our day, even more so. Along with homeless people on the streets, tramps, people who, like George himself, briefly uh, were competent, diligent, able to work, but unable to find work or make a living. Uh, recurrent cycles of inflation, deflation, recession, industrial depression. Uh, ever, and now tell me, I mean, think to yourselves, you can tell me too, 
Uh, have you, any of you perchance experienced this, the phenomenon of ever-increasing costs of living compared with the general level of wages and even advanced levels of wages so that you feel like you have to run harder and harder just to keep from losing ground, let alone becoming more prosperous. You, you've, you recognize that dynamic? Okay. I mean, it's not just me. Okay. Um, so, you know, when, when you consider that's what the economic landscape looks like, um, a kind of a multiplicity uh, of, of phenomena that are, you know, confusing and, and the writings of George's day on economics, as on our day, confusing and uh, not particularly elucidating why all of these things can coexist. Now let's turn for a moment to more classic science that you may remember from school, basic astronomy and particularly uh, planetary astronomy. So I've put up something here and I have a little thing I guess I can pass around, um, which is hiding from me. That's amazing. Yeah, I just have a few sheets of paper and if I tried to do this on purpose, I would be unable to make a sheet of paper disappear. Ah, here it is. Okay. Um, so I, you, you can circulate this, but basically for hundreds, actually probably thousands of years, uh, stargazers, people who, you know, looked at the skies, uh, noticed that you have, you know, for the most part in the night sky, and of course it was more visible before light pollution in ancient times, the fixed stars. Think uh, to yourself of the constellations, the, the Big Dipper, the Great Bear, the, the Little Bear, the Little Dipper, uh, Orion. Um, for the most part, those stars have remained for hundreds and thousands of years in the same configurations and the same relations to each other. So it was very easy for ancients looking at the heavens to uh, theorize, because the stars would move every night, even though they kept the same pattern, that perhaps the stars were on a huge, the inside of a huge sphere and the, with the earth at the center because here we are, it doesn't feel like the earth is going anywhere. And it was sensible for them to think that and, and that model and that, that, that view of the universe explained what they saw in the stars. But the problem was planets are also visible uh, occasionally to the naked eye and planets have a different motion, and that's why I put up this graphic and I sent that thing around. Um, the apparent motion of planets, for example, Mars as seen from Earth, uh, doesn't move in that orderly way that would be explained by the existence of a sphere for the, the, the stars. Uh, planets will, will move this way and then they'll reverse themselves and then they'll go back. Uh, there's something called retrograde motion, the apparent motion of the planets. And, and this, this kind of messed everything up. Um, how could we explain the motion of the planets even to account for a pattern when they moved completely differently from the way stars moved? In fact, the very word planet comes from the ancient Greek planetos, which means wanderer, and it's an apt name. That's why they're named, because they wander all over the sky. Um, uh, Ptolemy, an Egyptian astronomer who was uh, you know, very good at doing what he did, <laughs> came up with an explanation that involved a lot of curly cues, what were called epicycles, to account for the motion of the planets. Um, but it really took uh, a number of people, Copernicus, Galileo, uh, there was a Danish guy named Tycho Brahe, um, and then Kepler, uh, you know, looking at the stars and analyzing the patterns of their, uh, the, the planets rather, and the patterns of their movement, to um, come up with an understanding that we, we now know to be the case that planets actually move in elliptical orbits around the sun, an ellipse having two focus points, uh, the sun being at one focus, focal point. Um, and, you know, this, the, the Earth is not the center of the universe or the solar system, but the Earth, like the other planets, move around the sun, and that actually explains retrograde motion according to this diagram. Um, uh, and then Newton, building on Kepler, came up with the, uh, the, the laws of, of motion, not just of planetary motion, where he related uh, and explained the motion of heavenly bodies in terms that also explain the motion of objects on Earth. Um, he has the laws of inertia, and uh, maybe most powerfully his law of gravitation, which, which relates the, the mass of 
two bodies and the distance they are from each other to the force of gravity between them. And this accounts, uh, when he worked out the math of it, for the elliptical orbits of the planets. So that, that's uh, planetary science. Now, I, I put it to you as a question. That's what we'll be considering in this course. Can it be possible? Can we possibly have the same progress in understanding of the patterns of the workings of the world in the economic sphere as there is in what we think of as classical science? How could that possibly be true? Um, well, let's start tracing how George set about trying to do that. Uh, a quick word about the science of political economy, which uh, you can get for free online at the Schalkenbach Foundation. Or if you're uh, a somewhat archaic person like me and you prefer to have a book, uh, you can actually get it at abebooks.com for a couple of dollars. Or you could spend more money and get a, a newer copy from the Schalkenbach Foundation. Um, in any event, the, George wrote this book towards the end of his life. Uh, he had written Progress in Poverty about 15 years earlier. And he had always meant, well, I'll, I'll actually read you the very beginning of, um, of the book uh, where he talks about kind of the difference between the science of political economy and, and progress in poverty. He says, in Progress in Poverty, I recast political economy in what were at the time the points which most needed recasting. Criticism has but shown the soundness of the views there expressed. But Progress in Poverty did not cover the whole field of political economy and was necessarily in large measure of a controversial rather than of a constructive nature. To do more than this was at the time beyond the leisure at my command. Nor did I see fully the necessity, for while I realized the greatness of the forces which would throw themselves against the simple truth which I endeavored to make clear, I did think that should progress in poverty succeed in commanding anything like wide attention, and it really did, um, sold in the millions, uh, there would be at least some of the professed teachers of political economy who, recognizing the ignored truths which I had endeavored to make clear, would fit them in with what of truth was already understood and taught. But that didn't happen, so he wrote this book. Um, so, it, you know, following George's writing in The Science of Political Economy, we'll consider what is science, what is the science of political economy, and, and, and you know, was he right about it? Um, so let's, let's take a moment, you know, we'll start with the basics, and then we'll get into his particular insights about political economy, uh, many of which will be familiar to any of you who have read or studied uh, the progress in poverty, but I, I won't assume that in this class. Uh, I think people who have been through it and people who haven't will get something, hopefully, out of the, uh, the course. But um, let, let's turn, as George himself you know, might have um, uh, at times, he does this in order to work out uh, ideas. Let's, let's do something as boring as looking at the dictionary definition of um, science. So I, I took a look at the uh, dictionary I had at home, the Funk and Wagnalls Standard College Dictionary, copyright 1963. And um, there are a couple of definitions. One is any department of knowledge in which the results of investigation have been logically arranged and systematized in the form of hypotheses and general laws subject to verification. And a second uh, definition is knowledge of facts, phenomena, laws, and proximate causes gained and verified by exact observation, organized experiment, and ordered thinking. So either one of those is pretty much what we're talking about here and what George talks about in the book. Uh, there are more general definitions that people use sometimes for uh, meanings for science, as, such as expertness, skill, or proficiency resulting from knowledge. But that's more general than what we're talking about, because you could have the science of boxing or the the science of lying for political advantage. Um, but we're, we're talking more rigorously the earlier definitions. So I thought I would uh, just throw out there, um, this should be easy if anybody wants to chime in, but you know, just off the top of your head, anybody want to mention a, you know, a field of study that seems to you like a, you know, a classic and typical traditional science? Anybody? Biology. Biology, okay, fine. Um, Physics, okay. Somebody said physics. Yes. Okay, ah, physics, okay. 
Uh, so let's consider what the, you know, what the fields are of study for just a moment of those areas. In physics, what would you say physics is about? And I'm ready to jump in if you can't think about it, but. Okay, the study of matter or maybe matter and energy, if we can throw some energy in there. Okay, fine. Um, the, the behavior of matter and energy, how they interact. Biology, what would you say is the biology focuses on? Life. Life, uh, living organisms, uh, how they behave, how they reproduce, you know, and, and their constituent parts and operations, uh, let's say. Okay, fine. Um, uh, and, and then, you know, let's, anybody want to think of a, an area that is sometimes called a science where you have your doubts whether it really would be a science, you know, a pseudoscience, let's say. Economics, beautiful. Yes, <laughs> thank you. I thought it would take a little to get to that, but that's perfect, yes. And we'll talk about why that is the view. Although sometimes, a uh, little schizophrenically, it's known, and I think rightly, as the dismal science. So... Is it a science? Is it not a science? Yes. Is it because of the way it's studied? Well, I think, I mean, when you, when you are under the influence, as I certainly am at the moment, of George's writing, uh, the, the reason that, that that has some validity, that economics could be viewed as a pseudoscience, is that uh, there's a lot of confusion in it. Terms are not well defined or not consistently defined, even by the leading uh, experts on it. Um, but I, I mean, I think, you know, what makes something suspect as a science in our eyes, and we can disagree, you know, some people, for all I know, we have astrology believers here, astrology versus astronomy. But, I mean, what makes one skeptical, I think, of whether a, a body of investigation is a science is, um, does it explain what it says it explains? Does it account for phenomena in a, in a clear and organized way? Um, or do the theories, the attempts at, at finding explanations fall down? Uh, and another area where George finds fault with economics as such is that it, it's incomprehensible often and co self-contradictory. So is it even coherent? Um, so, okay, so I just thought I'd take a moment to think about science, and George does the same. Um, so according to... Um, George, there are several important elements in uh, a science. Um, one is uh, to, to work from clear and, and also easily comprehensible uh, and consistently used definition. He bangs away at that a lot in Progress and Poverty and also in the science uh, of political economy. We'll, we'll be talking about his definition of the science itself and of wealth and uh, next session, we'll talk about the production of wealth. But uh, you know, clear and consistent use of definition is important. Um, it, he also feels, as I think most students of science do, that uh, really fundamental to a science is the attempt to discover what he calls, and others have called, natural law, uh, which is pretty much synonymous with universal law. Um, I think it's worth my reading to you the end of the, um, the end of the beginning, rather than the beginning of the end, of Progress and Poverty on the subject. Um, at the end of the introductory paragraph, which I highly recommend, if you read nothing else, if you only read one thing in George, I would read that. Uh, so towards the end of that, he says, I propose in the following pages to attempt to solve by the methods of political economy the great problem I have outlined. I propose to seek the law which associates poverty with progress and increases want with advancing wealth. And I believe that in the explanation of this paradox, we shall find the explanation of those recurring seasons of industrial and commercial paralysis which, viewed independently of their relations to more general phenomena, seem so inexplicable. Properly commenced and carefully pursued, such an investigation must yield a conclusion which will stand every test and as truth will correlate with all other truth. For in the sequence of phenomena, there is no accident. Every effect has a cause and every fact implies a preceding fact. 
So that's his approach to what a science does. And uh, another thing to think about is, again, the, the idea of natural or universal law, which George discusses in the book. He says that um, it's sort of interesting because in a sense, uh, and he makes this clear, uh, political economy is a bit of a misnomer because the subject of political economy, and we'll get to his definition of it very soon, um, is, um, is not political. Well, let, I mean, let me actually read you his, uh, his definition. Um, he defines the science of political economy as um, uh, a science dealing with the nature of wealth, its production and distribution. Um, or another way to put it, the science of political economy is the investigation of the laws, and we could say general or na uh, universal laws or natural laws, that govern the production and distribution of wealth in social or civilized life. Uh, so he's, he, he sets out early in the book to be organized and clear what is it that he's going to be considering, what is the science. I'll just say it again because it's, it's a good thing to emphasize. The science of political economy, according to George, is the investigation of the laws that govern the production and distribution of wealth in social or civilized life. So a couple of initial points that he makes about that. First of all, civilized in civilized life or social life, civilization, George points out, which is what gives uh, us the idea that political is kind of uh, out of place in the term political economy. Um, what he's talking about when he defines civilization is it, it's not limited to uh, national borders. It's not limited to types of government. It's not limited by geography. Uh, what constitutes uh, an area on Earth that is worthy of the name of being a civilization is essentially the area in which exchanges and trade occur. So it, it, it makes sense, and people have talked in terms of Western civilization uh, or other civilizations. Uh, right now, arguably, I would say we have a fairly global civilization because uh, countries and people living in all the continents of the world there's a fair amount of exchange and trade. And that for economic purposes or political economic purposes is what George means when he says civilization. Uh, another thing that he clarifies that he it means by political economy is uh, that the laws that it seeks to discover are universal, which means they apply, they should apply if you found them in all times and places and in all, you know, in places with all forms of society and government. So if he su has succeeded by his own view in discovering these laws, they should apply whether you're in a democracy, um, a socialist country, uh, even a dictatorship, uh, a monarchy, um, a democratically elected government. Um, that, that the laws that he seeks to elucidate that we'll be talking about, he makes the point early on, uh, have to do with the dynamics of how wealth is produced. And this is more slippery, so hold off on it, uh, d distributed. And uh, these laws or dynamics obtain and act and operate regardless of the particular uh, quirks of situation and country and government and legislation that you find yourself in. Yeah, go ahead. Would you say sanctions would be in there? Uh, what would be in there? Sanctions. sanctions? Yes. Um, uh, how this government can impose sanctions on other countries. Well, well, we'll get to that, what he means by it. Because as I've laid it out, and I can tell from your reactions, it does go counter to the way we think. I mean, we, we feel naturally that government actions like sanctions or legislation uh, if, if the government doubles our taxes tomorrow, which I'm, I shouldn't have said because now it's going to happen, um, uh, um, it's probably happening as we speak, um, then obviously that has a big effect on, uh, on you know, the, the amount of money or wealth we get to keep uh, free of taxation. So how can it be that uh, what George is claiming that the science of political economy aims at uh, discovering laws and dynamics and patterns in the operation of, of economic things that somehow operates independent of things that we, we know to 
to affect us, and it feels like economically, I'll just leave it there, but I think the question is a good one. Um, you know, we'll be sort of exploring that. Uh, but that's, that's his goal, that's the point at the moment, is his goal is to find laws that would apply regardless of where you are in the world. Um, and, you know, we'll work through them, and some of them tonight and more of them next week. Okay, so um, political economy, it's a, a quick aside, political economy, okay? Outside of this room and outside of, you know, any reading that anybody may have done in Henry George's works, uh, where, you know, who, who do you know sort of out, out in the real world as opposed to in here who uses the, the, the words political economy? Nobody, exactly, nobody. So if, you, if you're, you know, enthused and inspired and you've been reading Henry George and you hear people like, you know, the instructors of these courses say political economy and then you go out and you're all excited and you talk to your buddy out there and, and they say, where did you go? And you say, I, I just attended a, a lecture on political economy. They're going to go, what? They're going to look at you like you have two heads. I don't have a big point here except for sort of the cultural and linguistic point that it's, it's no longer in common usage uh, other than, you know, what we're working through. Not to worry, I mean, the, the important thing is the ideas that we're getting at, um, but there, back in the day, up until, you know, probably maybe the early 20th century, um, it was still very widely known that economics, as we think of it today, was, was originally called political economy. It, right, well, there's all kinds of it. Yeah. yeah the way I understand it is, well, I think that's a valid comment, although, again, we'll, we'll get to that in a bit, but, I mean, that's, that's one way to look at it. But we'll, we'll be getting in a little more in a few minutes, I think, in, in a, a cool... Well, we'll even be discussing that. Okay, yeah. No, these are good points. And thank you. And um, so I, I can tell you're all still awake, which is really excellent. I'm, I'm really, I'm not, frankly, I'm not used to that. But uh, okay. Swell. Um, so, you know, these are the basics of George's approach for the moment. But we'll get into the, the, these points that you're raising. Um, so, you know, one of the, another thing in George's approach to the science is uh, the role of what he calls mental or imaginative experiment, uh, what we in, in more modern times might call thought experiment, as, as a way of conducting investigation in the science of political economy. I'll read you a quick uh, excerpt about that. Uh, how, how he, he talks about it, and I'll give you one example, but he very frequently uses uh, what's called thought experiment or uh, mental experiment to sort of explore the, the dynamics in order to try to find the laws that he seeks. Um, so uh, towards the end of, uh, I guess it's uh, chapter 13, book one, he says, uh, thus, in the main, the science of political economy resorts to the deductive method using induction for its tests. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but in its more common investigations, its most useful instrument is a form of hypothesis which may be called that of mental or imaginative experiment, by which we may separate, combine, or eliminate conditions in our own imaginations and thus test the working of known principles. This is a most common method of reasoning familiar to us all from our very infancy. It is the great working tool of political economy, and in its use we have only to be careful as to the validity of what we assume as principles. Um, I'll read you a, a, an example of that from, from this book and mention another one. But before I go further, I think it, it pays to pause for a second, thinking of science. Is this science that we're talking about? Um, and think about... I mean, if, if, if you think of, your, you know, a scientist, if you were, you know, a, a filmmaker and you wanted to cast somebody who would instantly read as a scientist, you would probably think of a person with a white lab coat and, you know, maybe instruments that could very exactly measure stuff. Um, and, and you might be skeptical to think that a big tool of a science could be thought experiment, but I, I submit to you that you, we have a great example of thought experiment in someone regarded 
universally as, as one of the greatest scientists of all time, uh, Albert Einstein, who happened to be a great admirer, I don't know if that's because of this, of, of George's thinking, um, who conducted thought experiments. Um, you know, the, the thing, the useful thing about thought experiments, just like sort of physical experiments, uh, is to kind of define a system and try to only deal with certain elements that you may change in thought and uh, in order to, to explore, if you're able to, um, the effect uh, of those changes on, um, on, uh, on a system and your understanding of it. So an example, uh, I think the better example is uh, from uh, protection or free trade. Uh, George, very often when he's doing his thought experiment, uh, he loves what I call a Robinson Crusoe situation. Um, and by that, he, uh, he means he likes to think of a very, very simple sort of society organization and often a society of one, somebody stranded on a desert island, and then he will introduce various conditions. And it, it actually is more useful and, and kind of interesting and informative than you might think uh, because the questions he asks of those situations uh, provide answers that we kind of know to be the case from our common everyday life. I'll, I'll give you, you know, so in, in Protection or Free Trade, where he is, uh, which is a little off the topic, but he's talking about the, um, uh, whether the mercantile theory uh, is, it holds water or is it, you know, is it bogus? Um, he suggests that if, if uh, Robinson Crusoe stranded on his island were to be visited by a ship full of all kinds of, uh, you know, prepared manufactured goods, uh, the idea that he might be able to essentially import those goods in a trade uh, of goat skins and whatever wood for, for um, you know, uh, a magnifying glass or, or refined bread or whatever he could get from the ship, he would be delighted. It would save him a lot of work uh, and some of the things he couldn't even make himself. And the idea that this would be a bad balance of trade obviously would be absurd. And then George points out, uh, is this any more ridiculous than what is claimed by the advocates of protectionism in a more developed society? And George also points out that uh, you can use these simple so uh, societal um, situations uh, if you don't ask too much of them because a lot of the dynamics you can identify that way. It's, it clarifies your ability to analyze and think and a lot of those same dynamics you, you can sense intuitively immediately would apply to a more complex society. In fact, I'll leave it there. The example uh, from, there are several examples in the science of political economy, but they are sort of further ahead in what I'm going to cover, so I'll get to them later. But the point is that he, he loves this tool of the thought experiment as a way to sort of investigate dynamics in political economy. Um, so uh, another thing, a very basic thing, he talks about induction and deduction. And, and he makes the point, which is also fairly well established, I think, or, or makes sense for people who've studied the history of science, that in the early phases of a scientific investigation of any given problem, um, often the, the early progress made in science is made by induction, uh, by which George means the observation of phenomena, you know, sort of close, meticulous observation in an attempt to ferret out what patterns um, there, there appear to be, what are typical sequences of events in what you're looking at. And at that stage, it, it could be called inductive because you're, you're trying to build uh, an idea or form uh, a theory about what are the underlying patterns of what's going on, uh, and that's in inherently inductive. Once you get tentative theories, well, let's jump ahead, let's skip a step and I'll come back one step. Uh, once you come up with theories that seem worthy of being called natural laws or universal laws, uh, such as planets move in elliptical orbits around the sun, um, then you're able to uh, 
uh, uh, science is usually able to accelerate the pace of its discovery. Working from, from those observed patterns that have the status of laws, you can predict what else might happen in a given situation. Uh, applied science becomes a lot more powerful. Um, once you understand, for example, the laws of mechanics, you can build bridges, you can build huge buildings that you couldn't have built otherwise because now you understand the, the workings of general laws. And that he calls more deductive. You know, give, given what we know, deducing from the laws, what, how, will, how ought things to be behave in a situation. Um, and then in the middle ground, he, he talks about hypothesis, which he thinks of as kind of a hybrid. You have a tentative theory about a general law, and in order to test it, uh, you, you, in that ground, he likes to use thought experiments to kind of probe whether this, uh, his theory seems accurate. Um, and that is not specific to George, but, uh, you know, I think is common to a lot of science. Um, so now, you know, before the break, I would like to get to um, a couple more points. Uh, one is George's uh, account of the history of political economy up into his time. Um, I think it's interesting and it gets at why one could come to feel that economics is a pseudoscience. Um, and you know, what he talks about is a kind of obfuscation, a confusion, a failure to define fundamental terms, which he talks about often in reviewing uh, a lot of the leading economists that came before him and of his day. Um, he also finds there's a certain bait and switch that, that in, in the universities that was happening even when George was alive, where uh, people may be hoping to learn something about the laws according to which economics works are instead treated to what George sees as overly metric, uh, overly mathematical analysis. And I think by that he simply means um, statistics kind of replaces uh, fundamental uh, insight that he believes uh, is more worthy of being described as the finding of, of natural law. Uh, but I, I want to read, as I've done once before, what I call the rant. Um, it, you know, uh, George it can be a feisty debater. He debated the leading people of his time, Pope Leo something or other, um, uh, the Duke of Argyle, uh, Herbert Spencer was a leading thinker of the day. And, he, he's not afraid, he's very, he's very skilled at debate, uh, but he's always gentlemanly, and even in what I'm about to read you, he's gentlemanly. I mean, he did work uh, as a sailor for a while, so I'm sure he knew vulgar language. He doesn't use it in his writing. Uh, but I think you'll find that here, when he's considering um, the, um, the, the people who, you know, the, his, his predecessors in the area of political economy, but particularly his, his contemporaries, um, see, see if you spot a kind of mood. <laughs> um, so he talks here in, this is in uh, chapter 8 of book 2, The Nature of Wealth, and it, the chapter is entitled uh, Breakdown of Scholastic Political Economy. And by that, he doesn't mean breakdown as in let's just break this down. He means like it's broke, it's, it's broken. Um, he says, progress in poverty has... Uh, been the most successful economic work ever published. Uh, I think that's probably true to this day. Its reasoning has never been successfully assailed, and on three continents it has given birth to movements whose practical success is only a question of time. Yet, though the scholastic political economy has been broken, it has not been, as I at the time anticipated, by some one of its professors taking up what I had pointed out but a new and utterly incoherent political economy has taken its place in the schools. Among the adherents of the scholastic economy, who had, who had been claiming it as a science, there had been, from the time of Smith, no attempt to determine what wealth was, no attempt to say what constituted property, and no attempt to make the laws of production or distribution correlate and agree, until there thus burst on them from a fresh man without either the education or the sanction of the schools, on the remotest verge of civilization, a reconstruction of the science that began to make its way and command attention. 
What were their training and laborious study worth if it could be thus ignored, and if one who had never seen the inside of a college, except when he had attempted to teach professors the fundamentals of their science, whose education was of the mere common school branches, whose alma mater had been the forecastle and the printing office, should be admitted to prove the inconsistency of what they had been teaching as a science. It was not to be thought of. I'll skip ahead, but I, I recommend this. Um, so he says, um, uh, Thus the professors of political economy, having the sanction and support of the schools, preferred and naturally preferred to unite their differences by giving up what had before been insisted on as essential and to teach what was an incomprehensible jargon to the ordinary man under the assumption of teaching an occult science which required a great study of what had been written by numerous learned professors all over the world and a knowledge of foreign languages. Um, and then I'll skip to the end of this. I could, I, I could read all of it, but I won't do that. Um, then, well, towards the end. Uh, the new science speaks of the science of economics and not of political economy, teaches that there are no eternally valid natural laws, and asks if free trade or protection be beneficial or if the trusts be good or bad, declines to give a categorical answer, but replies that this can be decided only as to the particular time and place and by historical investigation of all that has been written about it. As such inquiry must, of course, be left to professors and learned men, it leaves the professors of economics, who have almost universally taken the places founded for professors of political economy, to dictate as they please without any semblance of embarrassing axioms or rules. And then I'll skip to the end. This pseudoscience gets its name from a foreign language and uses for its terms words adapted from the German, words that have no place and no meaning in an English work. It is indeed admirably calculated to serve the purpose of those powerful interests dominant in the colleges under our organization. I think he means land ownership uh, policy. That must fear a simple and understandable political economy and who vaguely wish to have the poor boys who are subjected to it by their professors rendered incapable of thought on economic subjects. There is nothing that suggests so much what Schopenhauer in Parurga and Paralipomena said of the works of the German philosopher Hegel than what the professors have written and the volumes for mutual admiration which they publish as serials. And then he quotes Schopenhauer. If one should wish to make a bright young man so stupid as to become incapable of all real thinking, the best way would be to commend him to a diligent study of these works. For these monstrous piecings together of words which really destroy and contradict one another so causes the mind to vainly torment itself in the effort to discover their meaning that at last it collapses exhausted with its capacity for thinking so completely destroyed that from that time on meaningless phrases count with it for thoughts. And he concludes, it is to this state that political economy and the teachings of the schools which profess to know all about it has now come. So he's, he's pissed. He's pissed off. I think we can agree. Um, I, we'll say again? I like his style. Yeah, yeah. He, he, I think in that particular thing, you, you can definitely feel the frustration that he, as an author of a book that did well, has about being sort of ignored. He talks about his book just meant, met with contemptuous silence and distortion and so on. Um, Right. Yes. 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 Uh, you know what I, I it, Yeah. I. I mean, it, it's true that the the style. I mean, for me, one of the, one of the few um, perks. I'm in my day job. Uh, I'm I'm a lawyer. I'm an immigration lawyer, and I had to go through law school. Um, and although I came out feeling, I mean, I, or before that, I have a degree in biology. Uh, but uh, I came out feeling that my brains had sort of been replaced with dust of ancient. Jargon, but one of the sort of benefits that I didn't look for that I've noticed recently is it makes it easier for me to read 19th century prose, which is longer and has more clauses in it. But I think, as an example of that breed, George is particularly gifted. Uh, not bad for a, for a uh, grammar school graduate. Uh, of course, in his day, education it, it wasn't that unusual. He, he was a really self-educated. But he read pretty widely and extensively and obviously had a knack for understanding uh, and, a, and a knack for writing. So um, the last point before our break, uh, I think, uh, you know, I'll just consider, 
Another thing George talks about is his forebears in the area of political economy and even in his ideas. Uh, he talks about the physiocrats, which were a group of economists in uh, France, uh, I think in the 1700s it would have been, um, who had the ear of the king uh, and had a, a notion, it basically worked out that um, the, the uh, ownership of land was economically very significant and private ownership of land was uh, uh, it could be a very damaging thing. Um, and they had the notion of the single tax that uh, also the idea that um, there is a natural uh, increase in the value of land that has to do with uh, the development of a community. And that one, land, one piece of land is superior to another as far as its ability to produce wealth um, because of various factors in the development of civilization. And that that difference in value uh, which they called um, the, the, the net product or produit net, nay, I guess, uh, should be collected by the community itself. So they, they were early single taxers, although as George points out, they uh, thought this only applied to uh, 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 agricultural land, uh, which it doesn't, according to George. Um, but they had, they had some groundbreaking ideas, and for a while there was hope that they would bring this to bear on civilization, but when the French Revolution came along, it, it, it swept them out of uh, out of the public eye, really. And and they are virtually, you know, as as little as people ha may know the phrase political economy out there. When you talk to your friends when you're having a beer, um, uh, try physiocrats. I mean, you know, you, nobody would have heard of them. Uh, and even in George's day, he points out they they had almost disappeared from the scene. But they were kind of precursors as was Adam Smith, um, who wrote Wealth of Nations, sort of an early uh, political economist. Uh, but the interesting thing is that, um, well, I, I'll read you that G George had his, his, what I call his central insight that I started this talk with. Um, well, let me read you his, his relation to the, the physiocrats, because I think it's kind of interesting. He says, it is a mistake to which critics who are themselves mere compilers are liable to think that men must draw from one another to see the same truths or to fall into the same errors. Truth is, in fact, a relation of things which is to be seen independently because it exists independently. Error is perhaps more likely to indicate transmission from mind to mind, yet even that usually gains its strength and permanence from misapprehension, misapprehensions that in themselves have independent plausibility. Uh, I'll skip ahead. He says, and what is most important I have come closer to the views of Kane, one of the physiocrats, and his followers than did Adam Smith, who knew the men personally. But in my case, there was certainly no derivation from them. I well recall the day when, checking my horse on a rise that overlooked San Francisco Bay, the commonplace reply of a passing teamster to a commonplace question crystallized as by lightning flash my brooding thoughts into coherency, and I there and then recognized the natural order one of those experiences that make those who have had them feel thereafter that they can vaguely appreciate what mystics and poets have called the ecstatic vision. Yet at that time, I had never heard of the physiocrats or even read a line of Adam Smith. Afterwards, with a great idea of the natural order in my head, I printed a little book, Our Land and Land Policy, in which I urged that all taxes should be laid on the value of land irrespective of improvements. Casually meeting on a San Francisco street, a scholarly lawyer, lawyer A.B. Dutit, we stopped to chat, and he told me that what I had in my little book proposed was what the French economists a hundred years before had proposed. I forget many things, but the place where I heard this and the tones and attitude of the man who told me of it and photographed on my, are photographed on my memory. For when you have seen a truth that those around you do not see, it is one of the deepest of pleasures to hear of others who have seen it also. This is true even though these others were dead years before you were born. For the stars that we of today see when we look were here to be seen hundreds of, and thousands of years ago. They shine on. Men come and go in their generations, like the generations of ants. So that's kind of interesting, because if Newton, uh, you know, says, and he, he is reported to have said that if he 
has seen further, meaning further than other men, it's because he has stood on the shoulders of giants, in this case, giants such as Copernicus and Galileo and, and Kepler. Uh, George uh, seems to have developed some of his major insights um, kind of before he discovered the giants. So that's, that's kind of interesting if you believe that he was right. So I, I'll, I'll end that, uh, you know, this portion. We can do our break, and when we come back, uh, we'll get right into George's definition of wealth without dancing around and uh, sort of play around with that. And, um, you know, a couple of other, you know, constituent ideas he has to, to say about wealth because his definition of wealth is in its way probably more of a core um, uh, uh, area of thought to his work than almost any other. Uh, but we could, why don't we take a, a little break? Um, uh, there's, there's, there appears to be coffee. <laughs> 